Coach A, thanks for joining me today on this simple coach-to-coach -coach interview. Really do appreciate you taking the time. I know when we first sort of connected, you had just gotten hired, and we've been going back and forth, and so um, really thankful you're in a spot that you can um, uh, you can do this interview. Yeah, really happy to be here. Appreciate you reaching out and just being understanding of my time uh, over the past couple months, you know, starting a new job and moving and everything. So no, happy to finally be able to sit down and talk. So listen, it's not like you, it's not like you don't have a world of, uh, of experience, just not so much at DePaul. Um, you, you've, you've been a head coach. I mean, you were appointed head coach in December. So, mm -hmm. you know, six months in and, and, and maybe we could just start like, What's your soccer experience like? How did you end up in this position at DePaul? And and yeah, we'll go from there. Yeah, absolutely. So my previous stint, I was the head coach at Loris up in Dubuque for the last three seasons. Um, my wife and I are originally from Ohio. And so this opportunity presented itself and I I went after it because it got, got our family back closer to home. So that was one of the big um, if not one of the number one driving forces of, of this position. Um, previously in my coaching career, I was at Denison University and DePaul's in the same conference. So I was very familiar with DePaul. I had been to campus a number of times um, and knew the, the just the pride and tradition and history of the, of the men's soccer program here and just fortunate to be one of, only the fourth head coach in the history of the program. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, just a big uh, – a big change, right? To to pick up and, and start a new program, a new opportunity um, after only being at one place for you know three years, but it was uh, it was the right move for for the family. Mm -hmm. So I have full confession when I sort of did my my you know taking a look at your your history, um, I didn't realize you went to Capital University and that you are a Crusader. So as a Mount Union grad, this interview officially ends right now. Um, <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. There's, Actually, there's, there's some I had, good battles there. I, 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 I have some great capital stories and then very devastating capital stories in my career at Mount Union that um, I lost. And I say I because I didn't play very well. And, and we lost... The, or I lost the um, conference title. I think it was in 1988. I can't remember what year. They had you. You all had us play on like some patch of dirt um, well, on yeah, a I think Sunday. That was, and, and I think it was done intentionally. Um, uh, but anyhow, that was, yeah, I think I think I know where that patch of dirt is on campus. Yeah, it's really not yeah. used anymore. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, I, I hold resentments, but I won't. I won't hold it against you. Um, no so, worries. Hey, hey, let me let me just ask you, especially just sort of regionally. That's sort of really interesting. Like, ha, have you, do, are are pay, are players different regionally? This is one of my latest kicks, mm. by the way. Yeah. Are, are they different regionally, and or are over time have they have have you seen them get better? Have players in general gotten better yeah so i think you're asking just from being in the kind of the great lakes region sure, and kind correct. of going up to the north and correct. the differences yeah. um yeah i think it's a very good question i haven't thought about it too much the two things that jump out to me one is in the region i'm back in right mm -hmm. there's more there's more schools and mm -hmm. they're just they're closer it feels like they're more jam-packed Right. Mm -hmm. um, you don't need to travel that far to play a game. I feel like that was my biggest shot going up to the north was having to travel three, four hours for, for a game was just normal. Right. It was just <laughs> like it was just it was just how it was. Um, and then the, the hotbeds of where you would kind of recruit from were very specific to like the school more than I was was used to. Um you know, when I was at Loris, primarily we just attacked Chicago, um, and then really? obviously, yeah, and then and then Iowa as well, right? So we did well in Iowa. Um, we didn't do the best in Iowa in my time there, um, 
but we definitely did really well in Chicago, being only three hours away. So we were able to attract students that wanted a different experience. Um, and so I found a lot of success there. Um, during my time recruiting at Denison, I mean, that's more of a national landscape recruiting. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, yeah. So that was probably the biggest change for me was going from recruiting different pockets throughout the country to then recruiting more just a couple pockets regionally. Um, but from a talent perspective, the top is the top mm -hmm. and there was no difference there. So mm -hmm. the teams that are doing really well, right. In the great lakes region can compete and do just as well as the teams up in the North. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. and you see that as it plays out in the NCAA tournaments, NCAA right? you know, yeah. like Kenyon's making the elite eight and yeah. so is Gustavus Adolphus. Like they're, yeah. Yeah. they're, they're not identical schools, but they're from a talent standpoint, they're one and the yeah. same, yeah. right? So yeah leaving the conference that Kenyon was in, playing against them, playing against Ohio Wesleyan all the time, and then going up north and having to compete against the Gus Davis, the Luthers, the St. Olofs. That was the top of the top is the same. Same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's interesting. Um, yeah, I was going to say, even going up north, and you're competing against, obviously, different schools, but you're competing against the similar type draw of player students right like mm -hmm. who would be interested in the St. Olaf or the same kids give or take that might be interested in a Denison or a Kenyon yep right um so you are sort of the the competition that you experienced up there you're probably going to experience the same now right like it's just absolutely different schools yeah yeah, yeah. and that's kind of what I've recognized here and you know at DePaul DePaul's got its foothold in certain areas right whether mm -hmm. it's obviously Indianapolis in the backyard or yeah Cincinnati or Chicago. So um, that's every school, regardless of the sport or the athletic draw has its own pockets mm -hmm. and it's already doing really well. And so mm -hmm. as a new coach, it's just figuring that out, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, of where you might have some path of least resistance, just from some notoriety of people knowing the school. Yeah, right. Yeah. Do you, do you have aspirations to expand your not player pool, but sort of where you draw your player pool from? Yeah. Or are you no, just absolutely. looking to, hey, can I cement Indianapolis? I, can I can I get a foothold in Cincinnati? Hey, we're good. We, mm -hmm. we have the talent in those two places. I think in the short term, it's cement your, your, your foothold in the areas mm -hmm. that the program is going to do well in, the school is going to do well in, just mm -hmm. regardless of who the coach is, right? Make sure you don't lose – those foundational pieces, right? Like when I went to Loris, I had learned, it, you know, it took me a minute, but I learned really quickly, like Chicago is going to be the place that you want to spend a lot of your time. Um, yeah. um, and then eventually can you branch out from there? Right. Mm -hmm. So coming here, I need to make sure that I'm winning Indianapolis um, as best I can with all the other schools that compete within Indianapolis, but then mm -hmm. got to expand to, you know, your Cincinnati, your St. Louis, your Chicago, um, those are the next levels, right. That the school does really well in. Mm -hmm. And then once, you know, you get, you get a couple recruiting classes in and you start developing those relationships, then you can start looking for other pockets and, um, and reaching out to other areas of the country, right. Where, wherever that might be, because ultimately when you get to the programs to, to the top of division three, which is where I want to be, you're, mm -hmm. everyone's recruiting the whole country. Everyone's looking yeah. for the best players. Um, yeah, yeah. and That's so, yeah. You, you gotta you gotta eventually get to that level. I think it just mm -hmm. depends on the the path that you take to get there. You, you, you just said something that I'm now in, intrigued about that you're looking to to be at the top of the heat heap mm -hmm. in Division three. Is that your aspiration at DePaul to sort of take it to that next? I'll, I'll ask two questions that might be problematic but if you don't want to answer that's fine um the the first is is that your aspiration to say hey i want to take to paul and i just loosely defined hey i want to be us i want us to be a, a consistent top 20 team top 50 whatever that number is and then two were you brought on board for that purpose at DePaul? yeah that's the right. problematic one because yeah, I don't, right. I don't so, not to say uh, I not to say the other coaches didn't do what they did, and I'm not disparaging them. Just sort mm -hmm. of again, just just different purpose. I um right. So yeah, that is my goal is to be be towards the top, right? Something I always want to do as a coach um, is I want to be competing within the conference to win it every single year, right? I think that is 
my goal to me just saying, hey, we just want to be competitive with our own conference. Um, for me personally, right, just isn't good enough, right? I want to push to say we got to get to the point that we're, we can have the ability to win the conference. Are we going to? You're not going to probably win it every single year, but I, I want to say we want to be able to do that. We want to compete with those. Now, on the North Coast, if you're going to compete to win the conference, you're competing with Kenya and Ohio Westland. And if you're competing <laughs> with them, then you are competing with the best of the country. Yeah, very So, like, true. I don't have to worry about the mindset – of, oh, I got to compete my conference, then the rest of the country. Mm. I just have to compete my conference and I will be competing with the best in the country. Best country. Right. So that that's kind of the different piece here, right? Where yeah. um, at, you know, at Loris, it's fairly similar, right? You know, Luther mm -hmm. does very, very well. And, and Warburg's got a lot of history, yeah. um, you know, there and, and other programs, you know, were, were, were very strong in that conference. But the in the last decade, you know, Kenyon's done phenomenal. Right. So yeah. Yeah. just competing to at the top of the conference there, you're going to be you're competing with a top 10 team, a perennial top 10 team every single year. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. that's pretty simple. Um, as far as your second question, I, I can't answer what administration was thinking during the hiring process. I, I don't exactly know. Um, but when during the interview process, that's when they said, what are your goals here? I kind of said exactly what I just said to you. So mm -hmm. I let them know that. You know, I've, I'd, I'd had previous success as a head coach at Loris, and I want to continue that. I have no interest yeah. in saying, like, oh, I'll just come here, get closer back to home, and kind of put yeah. my feet up for the next couple of years. Like, no, yeah. like, I want to I want to compete. Yeah. All right, so you tell your you, – you do the interview process. This is where you want to be. How big of a deal in your whole process is team culture and sort of what you want to build at the PAW? going there for you and going to be well, for me it's everything right what the program does and what it lives and breathes every single day is you know winning isn't by accident there are things that happen when the lights aren't on and people aren't paying attention that make successful programs successful um so whenever you're looking at any program at any level having success you're just seeing like the tip of the iceberg, right? You're just seeing the highlights of all the work that goes into and um, building building that culture is basically has been the, everything I've done for the last six months. Um, you know, our spring season is limited, right? Division three, everyone knows that. Um, so our on, we only had, you know, 16 on-field opportunities, but we had other opportunities to work on our team leadership, work on our culture, work on our value structure, things that we believe in that are going to help us push for success when it comes on the field. So laying that foundation has been the primary objective of the spring. Um, and it will really start building more as we get into the fall, right? And what we do in preseason to help that. In my experience, like sometimes that can be a quick change, right? Um, or sometimes it might it might take a while to change that, that culture aspect of of the group. I've been very happy with what I saw from my group this spring. And I think we have the opportunity this fall to have a, a pretty quick change. Um, but we'll have to see how things shake out and things like that. But um, I was pleasantly surprised with how things really came together in the spring. Um, mm -hmm. Just being new, right? And, yeah. not, and, not, and not really knowing, you know, what, what you're walking into most of the time yeah. when you when you come to a new program. But yeah, the, the culture piece is everything, right? And in my experience of seeing other programs or talking with other coaches or just being around other successful um, programs and seeing what they do, it's not by accident that programs are successful. Mm -hmm. can, can I ask you, what, what was there anything, was, is it, like, what did you do? F did you do anything to start your interaction with the team or did you ask of them anything that might have been new to their experience and not like unlike anything they've sort of done in the past oh, that's a good question um i only ask good questions <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i um i think i i gave i believe in like a player led program right mm -hmm. where i can't be you know, the dictator, the boss leading the way all the time. Because eventually as a head coach, you just turn into dad and they just, they tune dad out. They stop listening to you. Um, 
and I remember my time as a player, right? I don't remember the times being held accountable for my coach, but I always mm-hmm. still to this day remember the times when my upperclassmen and captains held me accountable, mm-hmm. right? Because you care about you care a little bit more about your peers and and how you look to them. And so I think maybe to answer that question, the biggest thing I asked from them was just to have them take more ownership of their experience and saying, hey, you don't like what's going on. Well, you can fix it. It's not you coming to me and saying, coach, I don't like this. Can you fix it? It's like, no, you go fix your own problem, because ultimately that's going to drive more buy in with the group than than people just doing it because coach says so. Right. So that's probably I think they kind of were. Yes. A head coach has to do a lot of heavy lifting and there's a lot of things that are that are part of the job. But I think I maybe just ask more of them from a leadership standpoint um, of what of what it means to hold themselves or each other's accountable. Mm-hmm. I like that. I like two things you said. It's player led program. Um, and then what you referenced earlier, winning doesn't um, happen by accident. Um, I think, yeah, I think both of those things are very intentional moves, right? Like Mm -hmm. doing all the work and then, and, and having your players be the ones to step up because it is very, very true. If, if your, if your players don't have a sense of ownership, it's like a kid getting, getting a, you know, like a, a new car and not having to pay gas or any or insurance or even Mm -hmm. bought it. Like, Hey, this is just a car that was handed to me. Right. Yeah. Like, and so like one thing that I've always done is, you know, I help shape the conversation and push it in the right direction. Right. I'm kind of like bumpers on a bowling alley. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the, the leadership group, right. And that's part of my leadership structure, right. There's the coaches, there's captains, and there's a leadership group that kind of represents the whole team they come up with our values, right? Mm -hmm. They come up with our non-negotiables, not me, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I'll help make sure that those things are actionable, right? And specific, not vague things like we work hard, right? Like (laughs) too vague, right? So um, I I help them with that to make sure they're specific and actionable things. Mm -hmm. But then it's easy for me to hold them accountable to the things that they came up with. Because I can say, you guys said this is what you wanted. Don't come Mm -hmm. at me and be like, well, coach, I don't want to do that. It's like, no, you told me you wanted this. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. It, it, it just helps drive, drive you in the right direction. Does um, that change every, things. does that change year to year? Or is that, is that something that you look to, Hey, can we define certain things at a program level that players are bought into? And then you define your season mm-hmm. goals and objectives and values. Yeah, I think that there are things that as the leader of a program like myself that I set that are always going to stay, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Standards, expectations, things like that. Um, Mm -hmm. And to be fair, like, I think some programs have their own standard, right? Mm -hmm. It's not about the coach. Maybe a previous coach set those standards or changed some Mm -hmm. things. Um, But, you know, my analogy to talking to people is always like when Nick Saban leaves Alabama, Alabama football is still going to have a certain level of expectation and standard. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. And so whoever comes in his to replace Nick Saban, it's not like it's his standard that he's calling out from his players. It's the standard mm-hmm. of the program. Right. And then in the name recognition. So yeah, yeah. there are some things that don't change, whether it's the program or the coach has certain things, but no, I think the, the specifics of a team's, Teams every year, I think one of the hardest things for a coach is that you lose and change out a fourth of your roster every single year. That is such a large percent of a team that you are basically having a new team every single year. And you need to have things that that team, that specific group can buy into. And to me, that's what the values that the team comes up with. Um, Typically two to three, maybe four things. Um, Because, you know, you graduate 12 seniors, like – now your whole group's different. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is true. The turnover does. I mean, and effectively, every two years, it's almost like you have a brand, like you, your whole team is sort of turned over, right? Like yep. from your senior leadership was young guys. Now they're senior, right? Yeah. Um, I think for me, like having done this, you know, for the last ten plus years, as an assistant head coach the double-edged sword is always it's amazing that if you feel like you had a down year or not a great year 
you can turn it around because like, all right, just got to nail this recruiting class or nail two recruiting classes yeah, and we can yeah. change it pretty quickly. Right. Yeah. But then when you, let's say you have back to back years of success and you're like, okay, I got this thing rolling. Well, actually <laughs> you might actually just be losing everyone. Like yeah, you yeah. can jump up really quick and you can it, fall off fall really, quick. really quick. Absolutely. So Absolutely. It's that I, in what I do every day, I'm just the most impressed by the ones that have found sustained success yeah, over a that's... long period of time because yeah. I, after having done this now, because I'm not young in my 20s anymore and thinking everything's easy, <laughs> right? You realize that the how much harder it is to sustain that success. Yeah, um, very true. It's That's why it's impressive, like the Ohio lessons of the world, the canyons of the world. Yeah. And you could, and not they're just because they're near you, right? Like, right. I mean, they've been doing this for years upon mm -hmm. years upon years. We're not talking about, hey, they've reached sort of the summit, mm -hmm. you know, one year, and then, ah, they've sort of dropped back. Yep. No, they've been to year in and year out. And I think what goes, it's like the combination of school, but also probably more importantly, is I do think the team culture aspect mm -hmm. of it is yep. ultimately the critical piece. And if, if, Kenyon Ohio Wesleyan weren't led and now and Denison and were not led in a way um, that expected right their expectations mm -hmm. done all these things they don't sustain that level of success I don't think right I mean yeah division three is the biggest division there's over 400 yeah. schools that are playing yeah. soccer so yes the school plays a part to it right yeah. because there's so many different types of schools in division three yeah from yeah. academic level to school size, yeah. you know, at, after being up in the North there, seeing all the UW schools, those are yeah. <laughs> glorified public division one schools <laughs> playing division three sports. So the, the, the depth and breadth of yeah. different types of schools in division three yeah. is huge. So that does play a part to it, but you're right. The, who the leader of the program is and the culture that they've set up mm -hmm. helps maintain success. And so yeah. that's, that, yeah. that's a lot of it. Yeah you've you've talked you've talked a little bit about the ncac that you're 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 gonna be playing in in the in the fall well you've been the has been yeah. in but um um do you, i mean and you had your experience with denison i mean do you do you i mean how much of a challenge do you think it's gonna be for you in year one to to sort of have the type of impact that you want or is this i mean you're obviously i gotta believe you're looking at this as a multi-year how do we keep getting better keep getting better keep getting better and then yeah yeah no i think i mean the facts are there i mean the north coast is one of the best soccer conferences in my opinion in the country mm -hmm. um they could every year they get two in and they could every year get three in um mm -hmm. to the national tournament and that's i mean i think the only teams getting more than three is the NESCAC and the NESCAC. UAA, yeah. right? So uh, if you're even close to those guys, right? You're you're probably ar arguing with another, you know, four, five, six conferences being a top five, top 10 conference in the country. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, those are the facts. It's a challenge. It's a tough soccer conference. There's no doubt yeah. about it. We, we could play really, really well, <laughs> right? Yeah. And and still finish fourth, fifth, sixth, right? It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's possible. The conference yeah. is that strong. Um, up and down. And I think that is also another testament as someone that has experience in the conference to the teams at the top is like, it's not like they're just picking off bottom feeders all the time. Uh, it's just them yeah. at the top, right? Like they're beating legitimate programs mm -hmm. that do things the right way and, and compete at yeah. a very high level. That's, yep. They do. Um, the, the, the conference top to bottom is, is really, really there. So um, yeah, that's kind of some of the, the facts of, of the conference, you know, my goals, um, you know, I believe in like always saying, you got to have long-term vision, but short-term focus. So I got to know where we're going, right? What's that long-term vision? Where do we want to be in three, four five years? Mm -hmm. But keep the focus on today, keep the focus on this week, keep the focus on this season and not mm -hmm. worry about the 24, yeah. 25 season. We'll, we'll get there, but you got to build the foundation for that as well. Mm -hmm. Um, How how has it how has it been so far for your interaction with the team? You said you were impressed with the spring. Mm -hmm. 
like ha- how's yeah how's the relationship been going and and between been going, you and the new guys right yeah no it's been really well it's been it's been great i've been very happy and fortunate just how much they embraced a bit of change um because change is hard change is hard for anybody right whether it's a coach or players some players get um get used to a certain structure some like it some don't it like you, know, you don't get into coaching to make everybody happy, right? So um, you're going to understand that there's there's things that you do that not everyone likes, but at the same time, from an overall standpoint, I've been very happy with just how much they've listened and been coachable, right? I, I think that's the best thing I can say. They've been very, very coachable um, to bring in a different type of messaging or a different type of you know, the way, maybe the way I see the game might be different than their mm-hmm. previous coach or their high school coach or their club coach. So just their willingness to listen, um, because that can always sometimes be a challenge. I think, you know, players like doing things a certain way, um, mm-hmm. especially if they were seeing in, in their mind success, success, right? Which is playing time, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. And they're like, all right, I've, I'm going, go, you know, I've got a handful yeah. of seniors that have played a lot their first three years, right? Yeah. Some of them could be very like, ooh, I don't know if I'm going to like this new guy because he might mm. derail my senior year. Um, but there, yeah. there was none of that. So there's just been a lot of great buy-in from them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What, what sort of, what were your main objectives for the sp- spring being your first time being able to be on the field with these guys? Um, evaluate one, right. To see what is there um, and what the overall level is like. So evaluate, Um, the group from a program standpoint, right? What do I think the talent of the program is capable of um, like right now? And then individually as well, right? What are the individual skill sets of players of where do they stack up um, in my mind uh, from individuals? And then again, from the individual standpoint of, you know, how, what are their strengths? What are their weaknesses and how can we get the best out of them? Mm -hmm. Right. To help, um, adapt a playing style that pulls out their strengths and maybe not their weaknesses. Um, because I think that's part of coaching, right? I could say, Oh, I always want to play one way. I always want to do this, but if you don't have the players to do it, it's kind of hard. So, um, really just wanting to forget that (laughs) (laughs) really just trying to figure out what was here and just evaluate and understand Mm -hmm. them. Um, And then just the relationship building was the second biggest thing, right? Mm -hmm. Was getting to know them in small group settings or team settings or one-on-one settings, having lunch with them in the dining hall or just seeing them on campus and asking a lot of questions of what they want their experience to be on campus. Um, What do they want their soccer career to look like in their four years? Why did they choose DePaul to begin with, right? Where is, where was soccer in their decision process? Um, Because, you know, trying just to get, I was just trying to learn, right? Probably trying to learn as much as I could about them because if you, if you know your people, then you know how to manage them. But that's a, that's a slow and tedious process, right? It took (laughs) six months, right? And do I feel like I have them all figured out? No, (laughs) but I'm much better off. You know, I, I'm very, I'm sitting here in June, very fortunate that I had the spring and had six months to get to know them. You know, the yeah. coaches that start in the summer and they don't see oh their team in the preseason. Oh, my God. I mean, it's it's middle that's... of October before you figured them out. Yeah. You, yeah. you know, so that's a really tough situation to be in. So, um, yeah, I was just very fortunate just to have the time to get to know them and learn and mm-hmm. figure out their wants, their needs, and how I can best support them. So I, I, I have to ask because it's just popped in my head. Like, did you learn – did did you did you uh, do you understand better why now y- you have your reasons for DePaul and and wanting to go to DePaul but did you learn anything from talking to to your players about why a player would choose DePaul which I think yeah. is a very dramatically different right a totally mm-hmm. different reasoning perhaps yeah no absolutely I think um, you know asking the pl- one of the biggest reasons I wanted to ask them was, yes, to learn from them, yeah. but also it helps me in recruiting, right? Yeah. It helps me to know um, some messaging of, because again, 
having just gone through it four years ago, three and a half years ago at Loris, like mm. trying to learn a new school and figuring out what key talking points there are in the recruiting process. Mm. Well, once you've been at a school for a number of years, it's just the yeah, same, same thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so trying to learn, okay, what attracted you? All right. You're from St. Louis. You're from Cincinnati. You're from Chicago. Mm -hmm. Like what mm -hmm. about here made you even want to look here? Right. Did, mm -hmm. did the coach call you or did you call the coach? <laughs> right. Did you yeah. come to an ID camp? Did they see you at a tournament? What tournament did they see you at? Just mm -hmm. trying to get a sense of how, how that recruiting process was done. Right. Mm -hmm. um, helps me understand how I can go about my job here from the recruiting mm. standpoint faster than just figuring it out on your own, right? Yeah, by yeah. guessing checking, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, know, like, you can kind of get a little bit of a head start by pulling apart that information from your current roster yeah. of, of, of what they want. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. I'm like, man, that's probably a gold mine. Like just mm -hmm. understanding, Hey, why did you forward? choose to paw and why did you goalkeeper choose to paw right like it, it just yeah. sort of helps to complete that and again again assuming you know not that you don't but assuming you know nothing about that process right like that yeah. decisioning process right like that's probably invaluable yeah no because there's players on this roster from 30 minutes down the road and then players from the west coast right so it's completely <laughs> different so asking them like why do you want to come just to yeah. the neighborhood school you know, yeah. or why'd you come all the way across the country here? Yeah. And you get very different thought process and, mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, hey, so uh, how much, how, how much of an impact did you have on the, this recruiting, the class that's coming in in the fall, were you sort of intricate? Were there decisions already made before you got there or? Uh, I it probably um, probably fifty fifty. There was a number of players who were pretty far down the line in the recruiting process when I mm -hmm. was appointed the head coach, and so for a lot of them, it was just a couple phone calls of them wanting to get to know the new coach. But like they were pretty set on DePaul already, right? Mm -hmm. From where they were in their recruiting process, and they kind of just wanted to talk to the new coach, and um, it was just me sorting out some of the soccer stuff, right? Getting to know who they are as a player, what they're like, what position do you play? <laughs> right. <laughs> Things like that. Um, you know, what, what are balances in the recruiting and then just wanting to know, right. Who, who I am and, and make sure that, you know, they think that what I'm trying to do to the program aligns with, with what they want. Um, mm -hmm. And then there was another group of, you know, players that I kind of recruited once I was appointed. Right. Whether that was were just from some players that I had known from mm -hmm. recruiting, right? When I was at Morris, right? Just knew a, a pool of players. Um yeah. or just other ones that came onto the fold late into the spring. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And you've talked to a number of coaches, so you're probably and you understand that a lot of recruiting is done early, right, in division yeah, three. Yeah. And then a lot yeah. is done late. So late. Yeah. I was Very able true. to still do the the late piece of yeah. it, right? Yeah. Um yeah. none of the early stuff's gone, <laughs> right? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, but there was still a group of players that was kind of already um, pr pretty much moved down the pipeline in the recruiting process, right? They just hadn't made a decision yet because there wasn't a coach. And so some of those players were pretty quick in, in um, yeah, pretty quick turnover or time to turnover the timetable for them to make a decision, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, and then there was another group that was, you know, a two, three month recruiting process mm -hmm. of, Hey, I'm here. Let's get on campus in early spring. Yeah. Let's get all the applications in and things yeah, like yeah. that. How many guys is, is in your, how many guys are coming into the program in the fall? 13. 13. Is it still, Oh, are you still looking or, or are you pretty much that's, yeah, your, I, I will. Um, we're pretty much at the limit, but with that being said, every coach probably will say they're always looking right. Like, <laughs> Hey, if Leo Messi decides to go to college, you know, <laughs> right, exactly. like, eh, I think I can make room. <laughs> yeah. No, like you want to, you, you have to make sure that you have a good balance and you can't yeah. have a bazillion players on your roster, but yeah. the right player knocks on your door. You go see someone yeah. available yeah. that, that obviously it's not always about talent, right? They, yeah. They've got to check the, 
They're going to check the, the culture box, the character box, mm. the school academic yeah. piece. But if you find someone that late, which is possible, um, you know, it's not like I'm sitting there out there beating the bushes looking for players. Yeah, yeah. But if the right one comes through, then you would look into it and see if the opportunity makes sense. Do you have grad programs. Do you have do you have any transfers coming in? As part of that uh, group? No, no transfers at the moment. We don't have grad programs. We have some graduate, uh, like, that's it. Yeah. like non degree seeking like things that students can do. Licenses, so, licenses, yes. insurers, or whatever that word. Yeah, is. it's. Yeah. Um, but okay. no, there's not a full grad yeah. program. Most of we do have a couple fifth years, but they mm -hmm. kind of just push graduation back a semester. That's the COVID guys. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, Correct. Yeah. That's the COVID okay. stuff, but. Yeah. Some students were able to do their fifth year, but graduate, then come back mm -hmm. to the school and start graduate, so, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Um, where DePaul, most of them the, that are coming back just are delaying graduation by a semester. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes, that makes sense. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just curious because did every, you know, you, what you hear versus the reality regarding just sort of transfers in general. I mean, varies school to school, right? Like you, Completely. You, you know, completely and it's going to depend on. And it largely dependent on the type. I think it depends more so on the type of school. Like, mm -hmm. is there a very strong graduate program or graduate programs that you can entice fifth years to come in? Um, those are the guys that have the biggest impact. Right. right? And, and I'm speaking very generally here, not about DePaul specifically, mm -hmm. but a lot of programs out there at school, not pro but like schools, mm -hmm. Even if, if you transfer after two years and you're like, hey, I had two years at one place. Can I come in for two mm -hmm. years? It's, you're never going to get out in two years because they yeah. require so many courses so many, yeah, at yeah. their institution yep, yeah. that don't transfer yeah. over. Yeah. Now, if you've only done one year at a place, it's a bit easier, yeah. right? I think yeah. you, if you've done one year, you can still get out in three. Um, yeah. But uh, it's a lot of schools. It's really hard to go two and two, two and because two, yeah. not every credit's going to transfer over. Yeah, that's what I think I see. That's what I see again where where it's used like you're either getting transfers like you recruited a kid in high school they decided another option that other option doesn't pan out then they come back to you and you're like okay you transfer and that's mm -hmm. a transfer i don't necessarily in my mind that's a different type of transfer versus the hey i played four years i either have a fifth year or yeah. I'm going to grad school and at your school, college, university has the grad school that I would like to come into. I think those are the two yeah. opposites. I never, I very rarely, I think, do you see, maybe except for the cases of like, right, Casanova, Finlandia and, and Madet, Mada, Made, Made, whatever, that, right. that they're shutting the doors. So they've got these kids have, have to find a place to play. but. Um, I don't necessarily see those in-betweeners because, like you said, you're almost setting yourself back at that point. You're setting yourself back right. as much as a year, right? Like as much as yeah, a year. The, the the COVID year thing changed, changed the landscape yeah. dramatically, and it worked out for so many students, right, yeah, that yeah. they could play their four years someplace, get their degree, go start a grad program, and still play that fifth but, year. Yeah. It was like for, this, for the student right. athlete. Wouldn't. Unbelievable! I wish I, I, I wish, wish I could I go didn't. back. Yeah, yeah, right. Like unbelievable. Now yeah. it really you didn't see it a whole lot in the men's game, but in the women's yeah. game, women's game. Division, oh, yeah. you yeah. really saw it change the landscape when you have four year Division One level players transferring yeah. to Division Three schools, schools. Yeah. for that one but, COVID year. That yeah. changed. Like that's yeah. that's the thing that's not normal, right? Yeah, and yeah, we're just yeah. not going to totally. see that happening. Yeah two years down Much. the road or whenever yeah. whenever we go I, through the cycle yeah yeah this falls the last the last, last year yeah, yeah so well uh, yeah not to not i'm not saying bad about them because i really i think dan wheeler is an incredible coach and guy and but like johns hopkins is in the most fortuitous spot mm -hmm. for that because you have these incredible division one soccer players who just so happened that Johns Hopkins has an <laughs> outstanding graduate school. Like every, you know, it's like one of those, yep. everybody wants to go to Hopkins for med school, whatever it is. And so yep. they're the beneficiaries of that. And, and you know, you can't. And, and again, yeah, I, I think it's fantastic for the, the athlete. Yeah. yeah. Unbelievable oh, experience yeah. for the athlete to get yeah. to, to get to do that. And yeah. 
Um, and the truth is, yeah, they, they missed a year of their college experience because yeah. of COVID. Yeah. So they yeah. should have the opportunity. Does it, yeah. is there a, can some say there's a negative consequence to that? Sure. But at the end of the day, it's short term. It's not like this yeah. is a forever change no. and it's yeah. going to sort itself I, out year in a year. I, I do, I do think they need to go sort of go back to the old way and, I don't want to say penalize, that's not the right thing, but I think they have to go back to the idea of like, look, if you're going to a school, we want, like academics should be your priority and it can't be this idea like, hey, I'm going to DePaul for soccer. My soccer, my academics is fine, but my soccer doesn't turn out. So now I'm going to go somewhere else well i I think there's got to be you know whatever you got to sit out a year i don't know what the but i think that's something that needs to be reconsidered um so hey um last question for you what what are you sort of like your I'll just say short term immediate needs do you think you have in terms of building to where you want want the program to get to? Whether um, that's players, whether that's Yeah, I mean I'm gonna with the turning over of the of the school year here this summer, I'll be getting an assistant um, on oh, board. So yeah. that's gonna be That's huge. That's going to be, uh, yeah, so working on that process was going to be the most of my summer, right? Mm-hmm. Just meeting with some some potential candidates and just talking mm-hmm. about, about that. That's an immediate need, right? That will take mm-hmm. a, a load off my plate, specifically from recruiting, um, yeah. which, which will be nice. And then, yeah, from there, um, from recruiting, yeah, we're just kind of building that pool for the 24s and mm-hmm. – getting ID camps going and then getting out to events this summer and Mm. went to some state cup matches locally. And it's just, I'd say those are just the two biggest needs, right? Is always just staffing, right? Support staff, right? For a coach. And then, and then like, like we said, you you can be building and building and building, but like, you got to always be recruiting. (laughs) It's the lifeblood of your program. So Um, if you've got a long-term plan, you got to make sure you're focusing, like I said, short term on what needs to be done now. So you don't look back at at six months from now and be like, Oh, I missed the boat on some things. Yeah. All right. So that wasn't the last question. I lied. (laughs) Um, I just thought of one because I didn't ask it like what, and I'll be honest, I didn't get it. I think I watched like maybe 40 minutes or 30 minutes of a Loris game. So, so I'm going to like, how? If you were to be to sort of define the way you would you want DePaul to play, what what does that look like? I think I would highlight it in in, in these ways. I want to be very attacking focused and put the mm-hmm. opponent under pressure. I want them to be uncomfortable mm-hmm. um, in whatever they're doing and whatever we're doing. Like, I think that's where I start with everything of how I look at a team and how I want to set them up to play or how I want to teach them to perform on the field is I want the opponent to be under pressure. Now you can do that with the ball. You can do that without the ball, right? Mm-hmm. So I don't get too down into the weeds of like, Oh, I always have to have the ball or I'm no, I'm mm-hmm. a pressing or a sitting counter guy. Mm-hmm. Like whatever I can do to make the opponents, right. Feel a bit of pressure, right. That's what I want. I don't want them to have an easy day out. Um, some teams that might be, you're always pressing them, right? So you're yeah. focusing a lot without the ball. Some other teams you might realize based off your strengths, their weaknesses, you're going to have the ball a lot, right? So um, I want my team to be very well just educated and understand the game of soccer of like, mm-hmm. it's very hard to, you know, you can't give every scenario out there, right? Yeah. So how can you set up a, some principles of how to execute with the ball, without the ball, both the both transition moments and set plays? So those are those are the things I definitely try and focus on. And um, but I would say a lot of my training I focus in the final third and where goals come from and how to score goals. It's a game of goals. It is right. So <laughs> and where, where can you, where can you get them and how can you limit yeah. them? And yeah. if you're playing in the opponent's half, the ball's far away from your goal, mm-hmm. right? So that's a good place to have the ball, right? Yeah. Um, is in the opponent's half and you can 
work on breaking a team down on top of the box centrally. You can work on your channel play. Just find the weaknesses in the opponent. Mm -hmm. You can work on your set plays. Those are always great opportunities as well um, to to be successful and, and score mm -hmm. goals. You're right. <clears throat> it's a game of goals. Yep. Um, all right. Well, with that, I'm actually going to tell you I will – at some point in the fall, I will be in the stands at some place where right. you're playing. Maybe one of the NCAC games. Um, yeah, whatever. Whenever your schedule comes out, I didn't see it, but um, yeah, I'll definitely be looking. And I'm gonna be keeping an eye on you now, so the spotlights <laughs> are on. Yeah, yep. um, you can come. You can come watch, and then you can yeah. call me again and, yeah. and ask more pointed questions. I'm like, why'd you do that? <laughs> Yo, totally, totally. We'll definitely l listen. I totally get where you're at, and so I really do appreciate. Like, hey, for just getting involved, really, I do appreciate you, you, you taking the time to, to talk to me today. We'll de do some if you're game for it. We'll do something just before preseason, or maybe a couple weeks in the into preseason just before your season kicks off just to get your impressions about again now that you're knee deep in it right now it's mm -hmm. all the theory comes down to the ball rolling we yep. can we'll talk again that, that yeah sounds awesome. great but, sounds um, great but thank you again for this and um i uh, really do appreciate it. and wish you all the success this is um and i'm sure you're gonna have it i mean you're, you certainly have a great mind for the game and Sort of what you want to do there so i wish you all the success and to you and your match well, i appreciate it and thanks for you know taking the time to talk and and reach out looking forward to do it again sometime all right very good thanks coach all right thank you if you like this show make sure you subscribe so you don't miss future episodes you can also find me on anti-social media on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thanks. This is a message from my chief marketing officer. I think this keeps him happy.